Do you enjoy creepy horror stories? Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell for more spooky videos from Scare Street. Trick or Treat by Sarah Clancy We were both well aware that we were too old for trick-or-treating, but we had three movies left to go in our marathon, and the candy had run out. Since Cindy and I were on good terms with all of our neighbors, I figured that we would get something as long as we kept to our street. So, after tossing on some old bed sheets to give the appearance of effort, we set out. Kids flooded the walkways, moving as a chaotic stream from one house to the next and battering against our legs as they passed. It was still early in the evening, just dark enough to let the decorations shine. The mechanical growls and whirls of the more elaborate setups were barely audible under the delighted squeals as we made our rounds. While just about everyone rolled their eyes at us, they still gave us a handful or two of their candy stash, making it well worth the effort. We had more than enough by the time we had completed the loop and were headed back to our house. That's when I stopped at Mr. Wilson's house. I didn't know that he set up a haunted house this year. Cindy said, while we paused to let the stream of children pass before us. Mr. Wilson had never really been into the whole Halloween thing. Not that he ruined the fun for anyone else. Instead, he just skipped town for a few days. I studied the faces of the children as they passed. Apparently, his setup wasn't that great. They weren't laughing with their usual glee. But then they weren't chatting about how lame it was, either. I couldn't decide if that was a good sign or not. We should go check it out, I said. Cindy gave me a sour look. You wanted to see horror movies, and I gave you that. My charity ends there. There wasn't a person on earth easier to scare than Cindy, which of course made her the perfect person to do these sorts of things with. If the place was too lame to offer a thrill, at least I'd have her to laugh at. Oops, he spotted us, I said as I returned his wave. Can't get out of it now. Cindy alternated between glaring at me and smiling politely at Mr. Wilson as we headed up the path to his house. Trick or treat, we beamed in way of greeting. We went through the usual remarks as he placed generous handfuls of candy into our bags, but we quickly ran out of things to talk about. So I mentioned his haunted house. Mr. Wilson looked so damn proud of himself that we couldn't say no when he invited us inside. Cindy kept close to my side as we entered, but the tension in her shoulders soon faded. Dark plastic sheeting had been hung up to close the room off from the others, creating a crude maze. Dime store cobwebs with plastic spiders were tossed over a long, thin table while bedsheets hung from the ceiling, balloons plumping up their insides. Mr. Wilson further ruined any atmosphere as he ran about organizing his costume and hitting on an old tape player. The sounds of the thunderstorm distorted as the tape struggled to move. Mostly it just sounded like static. Cindy and I shared a glance. It seemed like neither of us could decide if it was funny or a little sad. We straightened our features as Mr. Wilson turned around. With his cloak and top hat, I supposed he was going for an old English gentleman vibe. Clicking his fingers like he had just remembered something, he crouched down and pulled a large doll from under the table. It was about the size of a five-year-old. 
It had a frilly Victorian dress, and its hair was matted, with its skin shining in the dull light. Mr. Wilson held the doll close to his chest, completely forgetting to turn it around so it was facing us, and waved his free arm out wide. Welcome one and all to my, I mean our, haunted house. Oh, right, uh, this is Jessica. It didn't seem like the arms of the doll could move, so he just sort of popped it from side to side, talking out of the side of his mouth to give it a voice. He still didn't notice that we couldn't see the doll's face. Cindy and I both said hello to the doll in an effort to play along. Mr. Wilson grinned. I've been practicing. Bet you didn't see my lips move. In unison, we lied, agreeing that we had missed the obvious movement. We couldn't bring ourselves to disappoint him. With a flourish of his hand, he took us into the next room. As we walked, he weaved a story about a haunted mansion somewhere in England. It was hard to follow since he forgot more lines than he remembered and was constantly backtracking to correct himself. The next room was just as bad. There were a few rubber bats, a sheet over the window that was already falling down, and a table set with bowls of cold spaghetti and peeled grapes. Mr. Wilson declared them to be intestines and eyes, before realizing that he had forgotten to cover them. He made his apologies, juggling Jessica as he searched for whatever was supposed to be tossed over them. So we politely averted our gazes and gave him some time. Cindy gasped sharply, and I whipped around to face her. She had one hand on her chest and was trying to catch her breath. Over her shoulder, I saw what had startled her. A mannequin was set against the wall beside the door, dressed in a cheap doctor's costume and its face hidden beneath a surgical mask. <laughs> Seriously? I chuckled under my breath. I thought someone was standing there, Cindy said just as quietly. Mr. Wilson recaptured our attention and continued with his story. I almost groaned as he took it from the top, still weaving the Jessica doll back and forth when he tried to talk for her. Even as boredom began to brew inside me, we made sure to listen patiently, chuckling and gasping at the appropriate moments. The only thing that made it bearable was the way Cindy kept sneaking peeks at the mannequin, like she expected it to move. I nudged her. She was startled, just like before, this time turning to glare at me. It improved my mood immensely. It's staring at me, she whispered. It can't stare at anyone. It doesn't have eyes. It was hard to keep from laughing at her as we followed Mr. Wilson to the next room, his kitchen. Here, Two mannequins sat at the kitchen table, each tipping at odd angles like they were about to topple onto the floor. Mr. Wilson rushed over to move them back into place. The movement was clunky, with none of their arms or legs moving at all. Each one had the same lacquered shine as Jessica, like a well-polished table. After they were righted, Mr. Wilson began his speech about them, summoning forth dark spirits with their Ouija board. It was the same urban legend I'd heard since I was three, so I took to watching Cindy instead. Her nose wrinkled slightly as she sniffed at the air. What? I asked. Can't you smell that? She whispered back. To humor her, I took a few discreet sniffs. Under the traces of candle smoke, there was a sharp note of chemicals. Not bleach, something else I hadn't smelled before. I shrugged at her. We were in a kitchen. It wasn't unheard of for someone to go overboard with the antiseptic. 
Then we were moving again, going into a little offshoot by the laundry room. The chemical smell grew stronger until it burned my nose. Cindy lifted her hand to cover her mouth. We exchanged a look, but neither of us said anything. There were three mannequins crammed into the small laundry room. They were dressed in cheap clown outfits with a bit of fake blood splattered across the walls, each drop statically placed for an easy cleanup off the tiles. The hallway light caught on what little of their body was left uncovered. They each had that same shiny finish, but they seemed to be older, with fine cracks appearing across their skin. Like breaks in a painting. I was trying to pinpoint what that smell was when Mr. Wilson juggled Jessica into his other arm and swept aside the curtain that he had put up to divide the hallway. The moment the plastic rippled back, a ripe stench wafted out. It mixed with the now ever-present reek of chemicals. The stench was an almost physical thing. I could feel it coating my throat a little more with each breath. Tilting my head to the side, I peered into the darkness and fought down the urge to gag. Cindy clenched my hand as her eyes adjusted enough to see the dozens of cloaked figures. All of their hoods were pulled up, leaving only their frozen, lifeless hands visible. Mr. Wilson turned on an electronic candle he had fished out of his pocket and held it out so that the light pushed a little into the darkness. The hands glistened as if they were slick. This way, Mr. Wilson said in an exaggerated tone. Cindy's hand squeezed me until it hurt. I was about to pull away when I saw her expression. The color had drained from her face, leaving a slight greenish tinge, and she continued to swallow thickly like she was going to be sick. What's in there, Mr. Wilson? she asked. He wiggled his fingers. With Jessica in one hand and the candle in the other, it wasn't an easy task. All of my victims, he said before breaking into a brilliant smile. There was something in the expression that made me cringe. It was a knowing little smirk, like a child that had a secret and was waiting with anticipation for the great reveal. I eyed the lineup of figures again. It would be easy to hide a friend in there to jump out as we passed. I meant... The smell, Cindy said softly. Mr. Wilson's smile grew impish. He was almost bouncing on his toes with delight. You know, I normally preserve them, but some have had the audacity to start rotting anyway. Rude, right? That's all right, though. I'm just going to start again. I waited for him to look away before I rolled my eyes and leaned closer to Cindy to whisper, Twenty bucks, it's old hamburger meat. Cindy gave me a sideways look. I don't like this. I laughed and nudged her with my elbow. How can you be scared right now? I had to grab her hand to get her moving again. The moment we entered the hallway, the stench became unbearable. Mr. Wilson had really gone overboard. With the mannequins on either side, we had to walk in single file. Cindy squeezed my palm, her grip tightening with every step. Using my other hand to cover my mouth, I tried to pay attention to what Mr. Wilson was saying, but it was a struggle. Every now and then, our leader would look back over his shoulder to check that we were still there. That smile remained on his face the entire time. That 
secretive, expectant smile. It was starting to get to me. I knew someone was coming, I just didn't know when. I couldn't take looking at that smile anymore, so I shifted my attention to the figures, sneaking glimpses at their hands and what little of their faces I could make out. Their fingernails were black. Not black nail polish, but a rotten, molten black that pressed up under the outline of the nails. Almost like a bruise. It was an astonishing amount of detail to give to something so pointless. It must have taken him hours to perfect. I couldn't pinpoint why, but it bothered me. I was grateful when we finally reached the end of the hallway and passed through the next curtain of plastic sheeting. The smell remained, like it had seeped into my pores and coated my hair. There was no ignoring it, and I had to swallow a few times to keep myself from being sick. Cindy pressed close to my side, not faring much better. And now for the end of my tour, Mr. Wilson said with glee. He reached down, placing the electronic candle on the floor in favor of grabbing a small metal ring. One pull, and a whine of hinges had the basement door opened. Cindy grabbed my wrist and pulled me closer. We quickly exchanged a look before studying the opening. There wasn't a hint of light, leaving the trap door as little more than a gaping pit. I strained to hear the slightest bit of movement. The setting was just too perfect for a jump scare. It took me a second to realize that no matter how hard I strained, I couldn't hear a thing beyond the soft murmur of the tape recording. Even the sounds of the kids outside were gone. Watch your step, Mr. Wilson grinned. I looked from him to the pit, then smirked over my shoulder at Cindy. You first. I don't want to go down there, she whispered. Mr. Wilson stepped forward before I had a chance to tease her, thrusting little Jessica out before him. You're scared? Here, take her with you. She was really brave. Cindy reluctantly released her death grip on my arm and accepted the doll. She took to fussing over it as a way to calm her nerves, making sure the dress was sitting just right and trying to fix her hair. I turned back to Mr. Wilson. He was still grinning, but not at me. His eyes were on Cindy and Jessica. For the longest time, he didn't seem to breathe or move or blink. I was completely forgotten. So, I said to break the silence, I guess I'm first. Mr. Wilson snapped out of his daze. With a wide wave of his arms, he beckoned me closer. I took one step before Cindy's arm latched onto my wrist again. She was doubled over by the time I turned around, her hair sweeping down to cover her face. Jessica clattered against the floorboards as Cindy gagged. From my position just next to her, I could make out the tiniest sliver of her face, just enough to see her jab a few fingers down her throat. From Mr. Wilson's position, it would most likely look like she was trying to stop herself from vomiting instead of inducing it. Before I could ask her what the hell she was doing, a violent tremble ran through her body. She squeezed my wrist until I was sure the bone would crack. Then vomit gushed from her mouth. The sight and smell were almost enough to make me go over the edge with her. I tried to pull away as she repeated the process to make herself sick again. Cindy! I snapped as a bit of bile splashed on my shoes. What the hell? 
I'm sorry, she mumbled, lifting her head just enough to glance at Mr. Wilson. I think it's all the candy and the smell. I'm sorry, I should go home. The words left her mouth so fast that they almost bled together. The way she sounded made it harder for me to be mad at her. Sorry about this, Mr. Wilson, I said, as I rubbed Cindy's back in soothing circles. I'll take her home and then come back to clean this up. Tiny droplets of blood welled up along my forearm as Cindy dug her nails in. I hissed in pain, but helped her to stand. You'll be back? Mr. Wilson asked. His unblinking stare sent a shiver down my spine. I nodded slightly. Yeah, I'll just get her to bed first. Mr. Wilson stepped forward and Cindy inched back. Somehow his grin stretched even further as he picked up Jessica and held her out in front of him. Why don't you take her? She likes you. No, Cindy stammered quickly. Thank you. You'll need her for your next trick-or-treaters. I didn't have time to even shoot her a strange look before she started pulling at my arm. A few muttered threats that she was about to be sick again finally got me to stop resisting. We hurried down the hallway, back through the kitchen and living room and out the front door. Only once we were crossing the yard did she let go of me and break into a flat-out run. I glanced over my shoulder to see Mr. Wilson standing on the porch, holding Jessica, ghastly smile still in place. I shrugged at him before I began running to catch up with Cindy. She was through the front door of the house before I had even made it up the driveway. What is going on? I said as I crossed the threshold. Cindy was in the kitchen, phone pressed to her ear and knife in her free hand. Lock the door, she hissed. The fear in her voice made me act instantly. We had locked all of the other doors before we had left, so I had expected the click of the lock to offer her some comfort. It didn't. Without turning on a light, she pressed her back to the wall, sliding down to pull herself into a tight ball. Who are you calling? Cindy shushed me, and her call connected. The green light cast deep shadows over her face and left me uneasy. Hello, she whispered. Her eyes darted around as she waved for me to sit down next to her. I could hear the muffled voice on the other end of the line, but couldn't make out the words. It wasn't until Cindy was giving our address, as well as Mr. Wilson's, that it clicked. She had called the police. What are you doing? I hissed. She ignored me. You need to send someone straight away. My neighbor has the girl that went missing, the one on the news last night. I was too shocked to respond. My mouth gaped as she continued in a rush. No, he's preserved her somehow. He's using her like a doll. No, no, I held her in my hands. I saw her face. Her skin chipped away in my hands. I saw bone. It wasn't a doll. All of her words jumbled over each other as they entered my ears. I just couldn't wrap my head around it. Mr. Wilson had been their neighbor for years. I think there are others, Cindy whimpered. The mannequins had fingernails, eyelashes. Please, just hurry. He tried to get us into his basement. No, we're home now. I tried to cover, but I think he knows. He knows. The thought lodged into my brain. It was chased quickly by another thought. 
we house-sit for each other. I strained, pushing through the chaos filling my mind, but I couldn't remember if I had gotten the spare set of keys back from him. A creak of the porch floorboard made my heart stop. I grabbed Cindy's hand and pulled her to her feet. There was no time to get out the back door, so I opened the crawl space under the stairs and shoved her through. The sound of keys clicking together made Cindy's feet falter. By the glow of the phone, I saw her eyes widen. I hurled myself in after her. There was barely enough room for the both of us, and our legs pressed together painfully as I hooked my fingers under the door and pulled it shut. Cindy opened her mouth to say something, but the whisper of hinges kept her silent. Sitting in the dark, with both breaths held, alert to every slight groan and creak, the voices of children grew and fell swiftly. It took me half a second to figure out why. The door had opened and closed. Someone was inside the house. The footsteps slow, steady, as if trying to minimize any noise. I could only faintly hear them as they trailed up the stairs above our heads. Cindy was shaking. I could see it by the tremble of the phone light that she was trying to smother against her cheek. He's here, she whispered to the person on the other end of the line. The call seemed at once both a protection and completely useless. Hot tears trickled from my eyes as I listened for more footsteps, desperately trying to place where he was. Mr. Wilson barely offered a sound, to the point that it seemed he was everywhere and nowhere at once. The moment I was sure he was in the upstairs bathroom, I would catch the soft scrape of shoes over the kitchen tiles. The back door would rattle, but shadows would slip through the light seeping under the door. I almost screamed when the voice called to us. Not Mr. Wilson's real voice. The one he had used for Jessica. High-pitched and taunting, followed by a giggle that set my nerves on end. He called to us in that voice, over and over, trying to coax us out. Cindy flicked against me when we heard cupboard doors violently ripping open. He was looking for us. We both looked to the little door of the crawl space. The only way I could keep it closed from inside was to slip my fingers through the gap and tug. Images flooded my head of a knife stabbing under the door and severing my fingers should I try. My mind whirled, trying to think up what I'd do if the door opened. There wasn't any room to move. I didn't have a weapon. The footsteps drew nearer, slowed, and stopped just inches from our hiding place. Mr. Wilson spoke again, keeping to that twisted, childish voice that I could have sworn was coming from right beside me, like he was lurking in the darkness with us. Police sirens pierced the night. I never heard Mr. Wilson leave. Neither Cindy nor I dared to breathe until we heard the police entering the front door. We didn't move until the voice on the other end of the line said it was safe. Slowly, we crept from our hiding place and into the waiting arms of a police officer. It was a moment of chaos, with the officers trying to get us outside as swiftly as possible. The strain on their faces told me that Mr. Wilson hadn't been caught yet. But it was what I spotted as they nearly dragged us outside that made me think they weren't going to find him. Jessica stood only a few feet from the hatch we had been hiding in. 
Her mangled hair was pushed back, allowing me to see the grotesque rot that Cindy had seen before. A note was written across the front of her dress, three simple words that meant nothing but promised so much. Trick or treat. We hope you enjoyed this story. Are you looking for more creepy horror stories? Click the link in the description or search Scare Street on Audible for a list of all our bone-chilling titles. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more spooky videos from Scare Street. See you in the shadows.